LWO on WeatherNet. Uh, lift off conditions looking pretty good. ASTS is ready for launch. Ignition. Lift off. Falcon 9 has cleared the tower. Ten, nine, eight. Side booster ignition. Six, five, four, three, two, one. On your screen is a live view of the Falcon 9 at historic Launch Complex 39A, awaiting its 1 a.m. Eastern Time launch from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Good evening and welcome to our launch cover coverage for ICSPI, or the Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer for our customer NASA. My name is Shiva Bharadvaj and I'm a space operations engineer and I'm joining you from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. The Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer is NASA's first mission dedicated to measuring the polarization of X-rays from a variety of cosmic sources, objects like black holes and neutron stars. We'll have a little more on the science XP will conduct a bit later on in the webcast, but for now, let's take a closer look at the rocket on your screen. This is Falcon 9, our two-stage liquid-fueled launch vehicle. It's standing vertical at Launch Complex 39A. Now, the booster supporting today's mission is flying for the fifth time, and this also marks SpaceX's second flight-proven launch vehicle for NASA's Launch Services Program, or LSP. Now, this booster first flew in November of last year. It since has carried three Dragons and eight astronauts to the International Space Station on the Crew-1, Crew-2, and CRS-23 missions. It also flew the Sirius XM-8 satellite to orbit earlier on this year. Now, if you're new to our webcast or are unfamiliar with the Falcon 9, that bottom two-thirds of the vehicle is what we refer to as the first stage. It's uh, covered by some Space white clouds around it, power. but it's also covered in some soot from its previous flights, uh, flights that you might catch in between. Now, the first stage's primary role is to accelerate all the way to the edge of space with the help of nine Merlin engines that it has at its base. There, it'll drop off the second stage and the payload. Then, the first stage will make its way back to planet Earth, where we'll attempt to recover it on our autonomous drone ship named Just Read the Instructions. Now, if you turn your attention back to that section above the first stage and above that black carbon fiber interstage, you'll see Falcon 9's second stage. About two and a half minutes into the flight, the stages will separate, the second stage will ignite its single Merlin vacuum engine and carry itself and the XP payload into a circular orbit. Now, if the launch wasn't cool enough, XP also marks the first Falcon 9 launch into an equatorial orbit. That means that the satellite will fly into an orbit that goes along the equator, which we refer to as having an inclination of about zero degrees. Getting to an equatorial orbit from Florida requires a lot of rocket performance and propellant, so we won't be able to land the first stage back on land. Instead, we'll attempt to land the first stage on our drone ship stationed off the coast of Florida while the second stage completes its orbital insertion burn. Now, the second stage will perform a second burn about 20 minutes later to get to that final circular equatorial orbit, followed shortly after by satellite deployment around T plus 33 minutes. Today's mission also marks the smallest dedicated payload that a Falcon 9 rocket has ever launched by a pretty large margin, making for a very roomy payload fairing at liftoff. Now, speaking of which, the fairing is that nose cone structure at the very top of the vehicle above the second stage, the fairing protects the XP satellite from aerodynamic heating, loads, and contamination during the ascent portion of the mission. Now, it's made of two fairing halves. Both of those are brand new today, and we're planning to recover them on our recovery ship named Bob, which is stationed out in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, we're coming up on about T minus 12 and a half minutes to liftoff. The launch vehicle and satellite teams are continuing towards an on time liftoff scheduled for 1 a.m. Eastern Time. Falcon 9 team began their final checks at about T minus two hours. Most recently, we completed the ground team poll to proceed with propellant load and launch that happened at T minus 38 minutes. We began loading propellants at the T minus 35 minute mark. Falcon 9 is a bi-propellant vehicle. That means we have two propellants on board, a fuel and an oxidizer. 
For Falcon 9, our fuel is a refined form of kerosene that we call RP-1, or rocket propellant 1. And to burn that fuel, we need an oxidizer. On Earth, most combustion or burning uses oxygen from, from the atmosphere as its oxidizer. And that oxygen makes up about 21% of the air that you and I breathe. However, in space, we don't have an atmosphere to provide that oxygen or other oxygen-bearing molecules, so rockets need to carry their own. On Falcon 9, the oxidizer is superchilled liquid oxygen, what we call densified LOX. And we chill it well below its boiling point, which increases its density and allows us to load more onto the first and second stage LOX tanks. Now, currently, we are fully loaded on fuel on the second stage. Fueling is, uh, fuel loading is going underway on the first stage. That'll continue about until T minus six minutes when it will complete and liquid oxygen loading is loading on both the first and second stages and causing that, uh, those plumes that you see around the vehicle. Now, once fully fueled, Falcon 9's first and second stage combine to carry over 1.1 million pounds of propellant. And we'll burn through most of that in the about eight and a half minutes that it takes to land the first stage and to get that second stage into its initial orbit. We'll also need an igniter to uh, burn that fuel and oxidizer, and for that we use a chemical called TTEB that stands for triethyl aluminum and triethyl borane. When it combines, it produces a characteristic green, green flash that we can sometimes see at the base of the vehicle, and that ignites our Merlin engines. Then those Merlin engines, the nine at the bottom of the first stage, will begin throwing out their combustion exhaust out of nozzles at the bottom of the rocket, and that pushes the vehicle in the opposite direction. It's a great example of Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now, quick update on the weather. We started the day with a 10% probability of violating launch weather requirements. That is to say that we have a 90% chance of go. I've uh, been listening to the loops, and we aren't tracking any significant issues that we expect us, that would expect us to hold towards today's launch at 1 a.m. Eastern time. The weather conditions also look good for booster landing on our drone ship and for fairing recovery out in the Atlantic. So with that, the launch vehicle, satellite, weather, and the range are looking good to go for that 1 a.m. Eastern time liftoff from Launch Complex 39A. Now, as I mentioned earlier, today's XP mission is for our customer NASA, and it's the first NASA launch services program mission being launched from Launchpad 39A. But it also marks SpaceX's fifth as part of the NASA Launch Services Program missions. Those miss science missions include the double asteroid redirect test mission that we launched a few weeks ago, the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich mission in 2020, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey satellite launched in 2018, and Jason-3, which launched in 2016. But our payload tonight is a collaboration between NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, the Italian Space Agency, and Ball Aerospace. The Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer will help us understand fundamental physics of some of the most energetic cosmic objects in the universe by studying the special properties of the X-rays that they emit. NASA's Tiffany Russell Lockett will give us a closer look at the main components of ICSPE, where those X-rays come from, and how studying their polarization will help us better understand the, co the universe in the years to come. To answer some of the biggest questions about what's out there in the universe and what it all means, we need powerful telescopes. NASA unravels the mysteries of the cosmos using observatories in space that study the different wavelengths and properties of light. The Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer, or XB, will study X-rays from some of the most extreme objects in the universe, like black holes, in a new way. XB will look at a special property of X-rays that has gone mostly unexplored until now. It's called polarization. X-rays come from the hottest places in the universe. Imagine powerful explosions, violent collisions, and strong magnetic fields creating chaos in the darkness of deep space. X-ray telescopes can trace clouds of gas heated to millions of degrees and detect the shower of particles 
fueled by a feeding black hole. Building on the discoveries of NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory and other space telescopes, ICSPE measures the orientation of X-rays from some of the most brilliant and bizarre objects in space. Like all forms of light, X-rays consist of moving electric and magnetic waves. Usually, the peaks and valleys of these waves move in random directions. Polarized light is more organized with the two types of waves vibrating in the same direction. You might have heard of polarized sunglasses. Boaters and fishermen use these lenses to reduce glare from sunlight across a body of water. Water reflects light in a way that causes some of it to vibrate in a direction parallel to the water's surface. Polarized lenses block light moving horizontally but let other light through. Much like the way light changes when it bounces off of water, in space, light becomes polarized depending on where it comes from and what it passes through. By measuring the amount and direction of polarization, ICSPE gives us clues about the shapes, structures, and inner workings of all types of objects that shine in bright X-rays. The ICSPE Observatory has three identical telescopes with three main parts, mirrors, detectors, and an extendable mast, or boom, that separates them. Each mirror assembly contains 24 nested mirrors that collect and focus X-rays. Located at the focal point of the mirrors, sensitive detectors made with international partners in Italy are the secret behind ICSPE's unique X-ray vision. They track and measure all four properties of incoming light, its arrival time, direction, energy, and most importantly, polarization. Over the two years of its prime mission, ICSPE will observe more than 50 brilliant objects, like the leftovers of huge stars that exploded into supernovae, the supermassive black hole at the heart of our own Milky Way galaxy, and pulsars, the dense remains of stars that once were. These observations will help scientists tackle long-standing puzzles, like testing competing theories about pulsars and the details of how Einstein's theory of general relativity works. New insights from ICSPE will help us paint a fuller picture of the universe, confirming or confounding our thinking in the years to come. Now we're just uh, over T minus four minutes away from liftoff of the Falcon 9 carrying the XP satellite. You can see the uh, strong back arms, the clamp arms that are around the second stage are starting to open. Those are attached to a structure, that truss structure called the transporter erector or the TE. And in preparation for launch, we'll open up those clamp arms. The transporter erector will uh, slowly retract away from the stage. As we get closer to T minus zero, ground hydraulic systems will further pull the TE away, clearing the way for Falcon 9 as it proceeds into its liftoff. Uh, we refer to the transporter erector sometimes as the strong back, and you heard that call out on the loops. Now the transporter erector is used to roll Falcon 9 out to the launch pad and raises it into the vertical launch position. It also routes power, fluid, uh, and communications to both the Eight rocket is complete. and the satellite. We just heard a call out there for some of those fluids that completed loading on the first stage. We've completed loading all propellants on Falcon 9's first stage. Now the first stage is connected to the base of that transporter erector by a hinge structure. And again, that'll retract further away from the vehicle in preparation for launch. The white gas that you're seeing around the vehicle is just from that chilled uh, liquid oxygen and some periodic venting around the vehicle. When it comes into contact with the moist Florida air, it causes water vapor to condense and forms literal clouds around the vehicle. Now at this point in the countdown, we're about 20 seconds away from completing propellant load on the second stage. And once that's complete, the uh, propellant loading will be complete on both the first and second stage.
stage two, lock load is complete. So with that call out, we've completed loading propellants onto Falcon 9. Coming up next, we'll see uh, some venting from the transporter erector. We'll clear out the liquid oxygen from the propellant feeder lines, and you'll see that as some white venting around the vehicle. And then the next activity after will happen around T minus 60 seconds when Falcon 9 transitions to internal control via its autonomous flight computers. Yes, close out, has started. Now, once Falcon 9 has taken over the launch countdown, it'll continue to have control of Falcon 9 through the rest of the mission. The launch director will give their final go for launch if all conditions continue to look good. And then at about T minus two seconds, we'll ignite those nine Merlin 1D engines for liftoff. Falcon is in startup. So with that, the XP satellite continues to look healthy. Falcon 9 team is tracking no issues. Falcon 9 is in startup. LD go for XP launch. So the launch director has given their final go for launch. So with that, we're proceeding into the last 30 seconds of the terminal count. Give us 30 seconds. Let's listen in as Falcon 9 takes XP into orbit. T minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. Lift off. Go Falcon. Go hunting. ISPE. Vehicle is pitching downrange. Nominal first stage chamber pressures. T plus 40 seconds into flight, successful liftoff of the Falcon 9 from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy nominal. Space Center. We're carrying the XB satellite into an equatorial orbit, and we just throttled down the nine Merlin 1D engines in preparation for the next event. That's the point of max Q or maximum aerodynamic pressure. That coming up in about 10 seconds. Vehicle is supersonic. Max Q. So with that, we are through the highest stresses on the vehicle from the combination of our increasing velocity and the decreasing atmospheric density. Coming up next, the next event in about a minute will be MECO, that's main engine cutoff. We'll shut down those nine Merlin 1D engines in preparation for the next event, stage separation. The first and second stages will separate. And then at about T plus two minutes, 44 seconds, We'll have SES-1, or second engine start number one. That's where the Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage will ignite to carry the second stage and the XB payload into orbit. So again, those three events coming up in succession, MECO, main engine cutoff, followed by stage separation, and then SES-1. And this view, looking down on the Merlin 1D engines from the first stage, you can see the plume expanding as the atmospheric density drops off as we get higher and higher in our atmosphere. First stage engine cut off. Stage separation confirmed. So those three events successful, main engine cutoff, stage separation, left-hand side of your screen, you can see a view of the first stage deploying its grid fins, starting its recovery sequence. 
the second stage on the right hand side of your screen, we've got a shot of the Merlin vacuum engine glowing uh, as it continues its ignition to carry XB into orbit. Next major event coming up will be fairing deployment. At this point, the second stage. Stage two on nominal trajectory. The second stage uh, is getting to a part of the atmosphere with very low density, so we don't need to carry those fairing halves anymore. We can jettison them back to planet Earth and then attempt to recover them. Again, both of them being new fairing halves flying for this mission. Fairing separation confirmed. There's confirmation of the fairing deploy, the XB satellite now getting directly exposed to the vacuum of space. And those fairing halves again will be attempting to recover those with our recovery vessel named Bob, which is out in the Atlantic Ocean. So if you're just joining us, welcome. We're about T plus four and a half, uh, excuse me, four minutes and 20 seconds into today's mission. Acquisition enough signal for me now. On your screen is a view of the Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage. It's uh, completing its first of two planned burns to take the XB satellite into an initial parking orbit. We had an on-time liftoff at 1 a.m. Eastern time. The first stage that carried the second stage uh, this far separated and is on its way back to planet Earth. Its next major activity will happen at about T plus six minutes and 20 seconds. And that'll be for the entry burn, where it'll ignite a few of its engines to slow down in preparation for entering the Earth's atmosphere. Now during the entry burn, we'll relight three of the Merlin 1D engines on the first stage. That'll start with the center engine followed shortly after by uh, two of the side engines. That'll slow down the vehicle as we pass back into Earth's atmosphere. And we need to slow down on the first stage to reduce the entry forces, which helps us recover and reuse that first stage. Reusability is a key part stage two on nominal trajectory. of lowering the cost of space flight, which enables more investment into the critical scientific hardware and research. Now, Falcon 9's first stage that supported today's mission will perform this entry burn for the fifth time, having previously done so for the Crew-1, Crew-2, Sirius XM-8, and Sirius 23 missions. And those brand new fairing halves will also re-enter Earth's atmosphere for the first time. The second stage continuing to burn, its burn will continue until about T plus eight minutes. And we've heard periodic call-outs that we are seeing nominal performance and following a nominal trajectory. Stage one FTS is saved. On the second stage. Stage one entry burn startup. So left-hand side of your screen, you can see the grid fins and you can see the plume from the entry burn. At this point, we are firing three of the Merlin 1D engines. And uh, we're decelerating the first stage, but we're still going pretty fast. So as we're flying into the Earth's atmosphere, that soot is actually getting kicked back. Excuse me, the plume is getting kicked back. Stage one, entry burn, shut down. Onto the first stage. And the plume uh, does is carbon-based, so that'll deposit a nice layer of soot on the first stage's surface. Stage two on nominal trajectory. Nominal shutdown of the entry burn. The next activity for the first stage will be the landing burn. That'll happen at about T plus eight minutes and 10 seconds. Second stage continuing to look nominal. Now the engines on both the first and second stage are different. The Merlin engines no on the first stage are optimized for sea level thrust, but the Merlin vacuum engine that you see on your screen is optimized for vacuum. And the difference there is how much we can expand Stage the pressurized two, is saved. gases that are being produced by the Merlin Stage engine. One, transonic. Call out there for stage one being transonic, so it's transitioning from supersonic speeds back to subsonic speed. And next events coming up will be second engine cutoff number one that's shut down of this Merlin vacuum engine. And uh, pretty close after, we'll hear a call out 
for landing burn startup on the first stage. Stage one, landing burn. And back engine cutoff. So shutdown of the Merlin vacuum engine. We've got landing burn startup on the first stage. Left hand side of your screen is a shot from the drone ship. Nominal stage orbit. Stage one, landing leg deploy. And correction, that's a shot from the first stage. And on the right hand side is a shot from the drone ship. We've deployed the landing legs, hopefully for a soft touchdown on just read the instructions. Stage one, landing confirmed. And that, that is a 97th successful recovery of a first stage on our drone ship named Just Read the Instructions. This particular first stage uh, having scored fifth, five flights under its belt. Now the mission isn't over just yet. The second stage on your screen is now embarking on its first coast phase and it's in its nominal orbit. So after this coast phase, we'll light the Merlin vacuum engine for a second time around T plus 29 minutes to put it into the final circular orbit for payload deployment. We'll see you back here in about 20 minutes, but in the meantime, enjoy the space jams and the views of the stages.
acquisition of signal, look at that one.
Welcome back to our webcast of the Falcon 9 mission carrying the Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer, or XB satellite for our customer NASA. We've had a great mission so far. The Falcon 9 launched on time at 1 a.m. Eastern time from Kennedy Space Center. We successfully recovered the first stage and the second stage completed its first burn, taking the XB satellite into its initial parking orbit. Now we're just about uh, 10 or so seconds away from a second ignition of the Merlin vacuum engine. That'll carry the second stage and the XB satellite into the final payload deployment orbit. So that uh, second burn called second engine start number two coming up shortly. And back startup. So there's ignition of the second stage engine. This burn was expected to last about 40 seconds. Now the initial orbit that the first stage uh, excuse me, the second stage went into, put it at about a 28 degree inclination um, with a high apogee and a fairly low perigee. This burn is taking us down to zero inclination. That means we'll be flying over the equator and it'll put us into a circular 600 by 600 kilometer orbit. And you're looking at live views of the Merlin vacuum engine and some uh, photobombs from planet Earth behind it. Terminal guidance. Nominal MVAC cutoff. So with that, the second stage engine, the Merlin vacuum engine has shut down. The launch team will be reviewing the orbital parameters. Nominal orbit insertion. And with that call out, we are in the expected circular orbit right above the equator, about 600 kilometers above the Earth's surface. surface. Now, as a reminder, the XB satellite is still attached to Falcon 9's second stage. We've got payload deployment coming up at about T plus 33 minutes. Now, if you're just joining us, we had an on-time launch at about 1 a.m. Eastern time, followed by successful ascent, then stage separation. We successfully recovered our first stage, and we've completed two second stage burns. Uh, and the booster, and actually there's a, a live shot of the second stage and the XB satellite above planet Earth, currently over Africa. Now the booster that supported the XB launch today Acquisition of signal, Melindy. successfully landed for the fifth time on our drone ship named Just Read the Instructions that was stationed out in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Florida. Reusability is a key part of SpaceX's mission to increasing the access to space, and we also had brand new fairing halves on today's mission. We'll be attempting to recover both of those on a recovery vessel named Bob. That is another great shot of NASA's Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer, or XB. This mission is the first satellite that's dedicated to measuring the polarization of X-rays coming from high energy objects like black holes and supernova. It's the first uh, NASA Launch Services Program mission that's ever been launched from the Launch Pad 39A, a historic launch pad at Cape Canaveral. And it's SpaceX's fifth as part of that program. This program helps launch spacecraft to observe planet Earth, visit other planets, and to explore our universe. Now the XP satellite does mark also Falcon 9's first launch to an equatorial orbit. The satellite is currently in a uh, zero degree, degree inclination orbit above our equator at about 600 kilometers above the Earth's surface. We're about a minute away from payload deployment. And uh, once we get into payload deployment, the XB satellite will then get to proceed with its two-year mission. Now, XB is an orbital observatory. Its job will be to study the laws of nature on astrophysical objects that we can't recreate in labs here on planet Earth. 
So we'll use the telescopes on XB to observe them in parts of our universe. Over the next month, the satellite team will conduct checkouts of the vehicle. They'll extend a boom that holds three telescopes on the satellite, and then they'll start to begin, uh, they'll start observing some of those astrophysical objects. The first one will be a supernova remnant, so the remains of a stellar explosion in the Cassiopeia constellation. Uh, it's an object that's about 11,000 light years from planet and Earth. And payload separation confirmed. So there's confirmation of payload separation. The XB satellite floating away from Falcon 9's second stage to begin its two-year mission to study some of the most energetic objects in the cosmos. And with that, it's uh, going to end our webcast coverage for today. So we want to give a big thanks to NASA for entrusting us with today's mission, SpaceX's fifth NASA science mission to date and the second in the last couple of weeks. We also want to give a big thanks to the range and the Federal Aviation Administration for supporting today's mission. And of course, thank you for tuning in and we'll see you again for the next launch. Thank you.